AM 1460 WXPR, the talk of Metro South. You're listening to PM in the AM. Peter Zimbor here with you this morning. Our next guest has a last name that is synonymous with wealth and power in the United States. She is the author of Being a Rockefeller, Becoming Myself. She's none other than Eileen Rockefeller. Eileen, good morning and welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much, Peter. It's good to be here. Eileen, let's talk about growing up with the last name Rockefeller. What are the pros and cons of having a last name, which, as I mentioned in the intro, is synonymous with wealth and power in this country? Well, certainly the pros are that it is possible if I want to reach many people, most people um, who I'm interested to get in touch with for a social cause or something I'm trying to do in the world, that I can usually get through. So there is a certain sense of entree that's very valuable in trying to make a difference in the world. The negatives are that people make assumptions about you the same as if they do um, if you have a different color skin or a name that connotes a certain religion that's different from theirs. Um, people make assumptions about Rockefellers, that they're going to be either snobby or Maybe they'll be selfish, maybe they'll be greedy, maybe they'll just lie there all day eating bonbons. I don't know what they think. But um, the challenge is to, as as all of us have is in finding ourselves in life, is just to be seen for who we are. We're chatting with Eileen Rockefeller. Her book is Being a Rockefeller, Becoming Myself. What are some examples you can have of a way that having the last name Rockefeller negatively impacted you growing up? Because you mentioned that people have this preconceived notion about who you are based solely off your last name. Well, when I was growing up, I would say that um, the negative impacts were school children kind of turning the other way, sometimes looking askance and wanting to exclude me, or perhaps they might um, ask insolent questions that had nothing to do with me, but more with what their image of wealth was. So I would be asked things like, are you the Rockefeller, or which one are you? And who are you? <laughs> well, we all are struggling to find out who we are. Um, but in those days, it would take me off balance. Uh, having written the book, um, and which has been a major process in the finding and becoming of myself, those questions don't bother me so much anymore. Now, we mentioned your name, obviously, is Eileen Rockefeller. You are indeed a real Rockefeller. Where are you in the family tree of Rockefellers? I am the great-granddaughter of John D. Rockefeller, who was the oil magnate at the turn of the last century. My father is David Rockefeller. My mother was Peggy Rockefeller, the late Peggy Rockefeller. And I'm the youngest of six in my family and one of and the youngest female um, among my generation of cousins of 22. Now, you mentioned that writing this memoir was a process. How do you mean that? Obviously, it's a process in you know, the actual physical writing of the book, putting pen to paper or, at this point, typing something down in a laptop or a computer. But did you also learn about yourself and reflect on a lot of things that have gone on through your life in uh, the process of putting this book together? I think that's really the purpose of a memoir, actually. Of course, you can use it to recount memories, but for me, the greatest, the greatest gift was in finding out who I was and how I got to be this way. When you do a memoir, and I was writing for five days a week, usually four to seven hours a day, and I did this for six years, um, you have a chance to, it's like meditating, but you just end up going further and further back, peeling off the layers of who you thought you were to who you really have become. Now, you mentioned earlier that one of the drawbacks of being a Rockefeller was that people had preconceived notions of who you were based on your last name. Some people also wanted to be included in being a part of your family when they were really not. What's some of the more memorable imposters of Rockefellers you've heard of over the years? Obviously, a few years back, there was Clark Rockefeller who uh, committed a murder and was not an actual Rockefeller. He changed his name. Right. And he... Well, and then there were people, like there was a woman named Viola Catagula, which was just an amazing name to begin with, but she used to come to the house in New York City and claim that she was my father's lover, and um, she would spend... A lot, large amounts of time trying to get through and writing letters. 
Um, and then I don't know. There, there always will be people who are trying to get through the door, and really all they're wanting is to be seen and to have some attention, um, like we all want to have from time to time. So I don't blame these people, but at times they can become a nuisance. Considering how successful your family was growing up, what was expected upon you as you came of age? I think it was expected that I would do something for the common good throughout my life, but there was never any specific, you will be a banker or you will be a philanthropist. The greatest lessons in life are taught through example, and my parents were great examples of um, public service. Even my father held has his day job, the C, uh, being the CEO, um, chairman and, and CEO of Chase Manhattan Bank. But in his off hours, he was still cultivating um, people who were in business, who were in politics, um, who were in power in one sort or another, of interested in trying to make the world better in his view. And um, examples of that are starting the Council on Foreign Relations, the America Society, the Trilateral Commission, to name a few. And my mother similarly built organizations from her passions of farming and land conservation, specifically in Maine. She created the American Farmland Trust to protect small farms and farming throughout the United States, and she created the Maine Coast Heritage Trust to create wilderness, maintain wilderness in islands off the coast of Maine. So these were really good examples to me, and by the time I was in my 30s, I met a mentor in Norman Cousins, and my first organization was helping to build the what's now today known as the mine, <clears throat> mine Body Field. I started the Institute for the Advancement of Health to bring um, forward the scientific understanding of mind-body health in healing and disease. You mentioned your husband. Once again, we're chatting with Eileen Rockefeller, author of Being a Rockefeller, Becoming Myself, a memoir here on WXBR. You mentioned your husband. What was dating like with the last name Rockefeller for you, and not only you, but your siblings as well growing up? I well... Mean, People people might have had some motives trying to, uh, you know, be in a romantic relationship with a Rockefeller, one would think. Yes, that's probably true. My mother had a very strong antennae about who was a, a fake and who was real. And I think she somehow passed those attributes on down to us. And certainly for myself, I can tell when somebody walks in the room if they're there to be seen in an ostentatious way, whether they're depressed, whether they're angry, whether they're going to be trying to get something from me. So it's actually fairly transparent to me at this point. Um, in the early days when I was first learning those things, oh, maybe I'd spend a little time with somebody, but in terms of dating, I really could see through to whether somebody was real or not. And when I met my husband, I knew in four hours I was going to marry him. It may sound amazing, but I did. <laughs> that, that does sound amazing. That's a pretty quick, <laughs> I know this is the guy I'm spending the rest of my life with, four hours. Four hours. It took him five months, but that wasn't too <laughs> long either. And on our first date, we discussed... Um, he's Jewish and was raised as a Jew, and so we talked about the ways in which Rockefellers and Jews have things in common, particularly our values of public service, of closeness and belief in the closeness of family, of the connection to nature, of philanthropy. And also what we had in common were what you've talked about in several questions. What do people think about you before they even know you? and people, the, the presuppositions that people make and assumptions that they make before they actually know you, the person. So those were bonds for us and um, have become lifelong, uh, the basis for a lifelong bond. It's now been almost 33 years. Do you have any brothers, Eileen? I have two brothers and three sisters. 
Did your brothers have different experiences considering their males uh, growing up with the last name Rockefeller and dating? Because I would think that men are far more likely to abuse having a powerful last name than women uh, when it comes to romantic encounters. Uh, well, I don't think they've ever abused having a powerful name. In some ways, there are advantages to having the name Rockefeller That's out there. That's probably the more accurate word I should have used. Yeah, well, because at least if it's out there, you're not hiding it, and you're not hiding from it, and you know that they know that that's your name. If you're using an assumed name or your middle name or a married name, you're never quite sure. Do they know or do they not know? And um, I decided when writing this book, I'm just going to put it out there because it's been the elephant in the room all my life, and I'd rather people know and we have a frank and honest conversation like you and I are having uh, right from the get-go. We're chatting with Eileen Rockefeller here on WXPR. Eileen, what is your relationship like with your children? How does their upbringing compare to yours? And at what point do you think that your children, or at what point did you realize in your life that your last name had a certain connotation to it? Uh, well, those are two very different questions. In terms of my children, I am blessed. I have a wonderful relationship with both of my sons. Uh, it hasn't been without challenges, but the difference between my parenting and my parents is that my husband and I decided first off that by the time they were about three and five, we decided we weren't going to hide our disagreements. We weren't going to pretend we were in a good mood if we weren't. Um, sometimes I may have taken that. They, they accuse me of taking it to more of an extreme than I might have. On the other hand, we taught them a vocabulary of feelings, and we taught them tools for how to express them in safe ways that lead to resolution. So, for example, we created the talking heart. It's something I'm going to be talking more about on my website, EileenRockefeller.com, um, actually starting tomorrow. And um, I have a chapter in my book about how we use this literal stuffed red velvet heart to help our sons express what they didn't like if one of them had hurt the other, how it made them feel, and what they would have preferred. And it was enormously effective. My parents never even wanted to hear how we felt. So I went to the other extreme and really encouraged it. And to this day, our sons use those techniques sometimes in, when there's conflict among their friends or with their friends. They use it with us. Um, and the result is we have a really authentic relationship. Now, when you get attention, it's you know usually for things such as, obviously, this interview, you have a memoir out, different philanthropic adventures and things of that nature. But outside of that, you do live a fairly low-key life. Correct me if I'm wrong, you make your home in Vermont? Yes, I do. On an organic farm, we grow our own vegetables. What do you think it is that separates the way that you were raised and the way it seems that you're raising your children, say, with the way that some other people with noteworthy last names, not to the caliber of the Rockefellers, were raised, but to the point where they live in big cities and they spend their nights, the, the kids growing up, they spend their nights out clubbing and looking to get newspapers, tabloids, and TMZ. <laughs> well, I think authenticity probably should have been my mother's middle name. She was had such a sharp eye for what was authentic, what wasn't authentic. Perhaps this came from growing up in a middle-class family where actually her parents aspired des somewhat desperately to be in the upper echelons of society. And, they, and then when she married David Rockefeller, it's like, oh, she's made it. But she got to see that, I mean, I describe in, in my book a, such a sad story of her mother coming and um, she somehow got a key to the house in New York early on and would walk in unannounced and make what was then very expensive long-distance telephone calls and order the cook and the maid and those people as if they were hers until finally my mother went to therapy enough to get the courage up to take the key away and change the locks. Um, so I think in a sense 
her drive for authenticity was um, born out of the contrast to her parents. And um, I just think that it's, it's essential that even if you have money, that you teach your children through your own example, what things do you really, really value? And I'm grateful that I value nature as a teacher and the connection to nature and animals as some of the great teachers of compassion, because animals are different from us. And if you grow up without them, you don't learn that sense of different and from similar. And actually, there's been research to show that animals are essential in children's lives to develop empathy. So that was a very important piece for us, although we did raise our children the first eight and ten years in the city of San Francisco. So they've had exposure to both city and country. Well, it's a fascinating story. Being a Rockefeller, becoming myself a memoir. Aline Rockefeller is our guest here on WXBR. You have some interesting outlooks on the world and some sincere beliefs, it appears. You mentioned earlier some things that you are involved with. What keeps you busy on a day-to-day basis circa 2014? You're involved with a number of different projects. Well, what I'm most involved with right now with my husband, once our sons went off to college in 2007 when they both were gone, we decided it was time for another form of partnership, and we chose to do our philanthropy in a more studied and strategic way together. And we hired um, a philanthropic advisor, Joanna Messing, and she... And we spent six months figuring out what we felt was most important to make a difference in the world with really very limited funds. Um, And I mean about um, one and a half million a year, which may not seem limited for many people, but to really make a difference in the world, that's a very small amount. We became most interested in climate change and stemming climate change and decided ultimately that the greatest leverage could be in stopping new coal-fire power plants from being built as a means of reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is which accounts uh, coal accounts for 40% of all CO2 in the atmosphere. A little less than that now, because since 2007, having given the first grant to start the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign when there were 200 proposed new plants at that time, 172 of them have been stopped from ever being built now. And our contribution, the first one of 150,000, plus the mandate that they must create a business plan so that they could measure the results of their work, ended up being the very thing that got Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York City, to choose Sierra Club to give $50 million to for the same reason um, five years later. So that is our greatest success story. We've now taken our work globally. There are about 1,200 new proposed plants throughout the world. And it's a race. It's a race to stop the very worst of the offenders. And we have seen evidence that where coal is stopped, ingenuity begins with new, more advanced, sustainable technology. It's interesting you mentioned that because there is a debate raging on in the city, which uh, our broadcast signal emanates from Brockton, Massachusetts, just south of Boston, over a gas-fueled power plant. I believe that's a little bit different from a coal-fueled power plant, but there's been Uh a debate raging on amongst people who uh, some feel that it will not be good for the environment, and others feel that it really won't have an effect. So it is unique that you mentioned that. We're chatting with Eileen Rockefeller here on WXPR. Eileen, you mentioned earlier on in the interview that with your last name, you have been able to get in touch with people who otherwise you feel that you would not be able to get in touch with when it comes to some of these different philanthropic adventures. Uh, can you give us an example of a time where you were able to make contact with someone uh, based on your last name that you don't think you would have been otherwise? Oh, sure. Well, when I was interested in starting the Institute for the Advancement of Health, which ultimately played a role in pioneering the field of mind-body health, um, I decided to meet with some of the 
more prominent critics of the field first. And at that time, one of them was the president of Rockefeller University, the Nobel laureate, Joshua, the late uh, Joshua Letterberg. Um, I went to see him and talk about this in a chapter in my book to ask his blessings, if you will, for her. Would this be a field worth spending my time at? And when he heard my story and about Norman Cousins, who I knew was had more, much more popular opinion than medical opinion, um, he said, why don't you do something real in science? And I looked at him and very innocently said, well, just in case I were to be so ignorant as to persist, who would you suggest I get involved? And he mentioned three people. One was the Chancellor of Memorial Sloan Kettering, then Lewis Thomas, and the founder of Biofeedback, then Neil Miller, and uh, the chief of psychiatry at Memorial, uh, Jimmy Holland, a woman. He said, well, I guess if you got any one of them involved, I would take it more seriously. Well, the end result was I got all three of them. And I wouldn't have gotten through to Joshua Letterberg or to any of those three had I not had the last name Rockefeller. Well, it's fascinating stuff. Eileen Rockefeller here on WXBR. The book is Being a Rockefeller, Becoming Myself, a memoir. Eileen, you live in Vermont now. I believe you own some property in Maine as well. You are a New England gal in a sense. I sure am. I love New England. Uh, In fact, a lot of the pictures I put up on my website are taken from New England. I love to take pictures, too. So, And I hope people will visit my website. I have a blog that comes out every Tuesday, a post that comes every Tuesday on my blog um, at EileenRockefeller.com. And I have a really good time connecting with people. I think one of the, um, one of the, the optimistic and positive things that has been an outgrowth of growing up, kind of the lonely youngest child of six that, who was not included then, is that I have a very strong drive for connection, and I really enjoy talking and uh, emailing with people and hearing their stories. And I'm utterly delighted and surprised to find that uh, a number of people have written to say how my stories have inspired them to talk with their mother or their brother or sister or, or their spouse in a new way. Well, Eileen, we've enjoyed talking with you this morning. We want to remind our listeners that the book is Being a Rockefeller, Becoming Myself. It's a memoir, Eileen. Any final words for our listeners before I let you go this morning? Uh, That I think listening is one of the most important parts of healing. And I thank all of my listeners here for listening to me, and I hope I'll have an opportunity to listen to you as I've enjoyed listening to and talking with you, Peter. Thank you so much for having me on the on the call. Well, thank you so much. That's Eileen Rockefeller joining us here on WXBR. We're going to step aside for a quick break. Mike Pave is going to bring us a news update. Stick with us here in the Metro South Morning Show, PM in the AM.